class and welcome to business 1a financial accounting this is our first chapter called accounting and business this is a massive chapter we're covering a lot of information here so what I'm going to do I will divide this chapter into three components into three different videos so in this first part of the video we will cover these three objectives We'll talk about the definition of accounting, its users, um, a little bit I will mention very briefly about accounting careers, and we will cover basic fundamentals such as ethics, fraud, gap, which is generally accepted accounting principles. Um, and then in the second video, I will cover ac accounting equation and business transaction analysis. And then in the third video, we will cover financial statements for financial statements and then guys every chapter will will conclude with a ratio or a couple of ratios so in chapter one we're, co uh, we're covering ratio called return on assets or you might have heard of it it's also called return on investment or ROI so let's go ahead <clears throat> so the purpose and importance of accounting so there is a perception out there that accounting is a boring process of just being counting. And the perception of some people outside of the field is that accounting is mechanical, black and white. We have data, we have rules. It's very just black and white. There's right decisions and wrong decisions. And then, um, you know, based on these decisions, we simply record, count bins, we record assets, liabilities, create financial statements. In reality, uh, accounting is seen as a profession that enables decision making. It's all about making good decisions. So we as accountants have our own framework just like doctors have the framework or architects or lawyers. So we're looking at economic activities, we're looking at transactions, at the economic events. And when we start analyzing them, we analyze it through the perspective, through the, frame, uh, through the framework of accounting. And so accounting is not black and white. We have to use judgments. There are all types of shades of gray. You will see it in this course. And then we... Uh, generate useful information. This useful information we come up with could be uh, in tables, it could be quantitative, meaning in numbers, it could be uh, non-numeric or qualitative, this information, it could be graphic, and we give this information to the users uh, inside and outside of our organizations. And so the users can make good decisions with the ultimate goal of the prosperous society. So it's all about making, providing information for making good decisions. So that's what we call accounting, people who know accounting, who love it. And I hope that throughout this course, you will appreciate the beauty, the logic, the critical thinking that accounting allows us. So my goal through education, through this course, is to move you from a perception of accounting being black and white, correct or incorrect, to the reality and decision making and providing good information for making good decisions. So this is a definition of accounting from your textbook. I'm not going to read it again. Uh, and again, it's all about making decisions. Decisions. We help users make better decisions. Well, who are those users? So there are two large groups of users, right? So we are called Warren Buffett, actually, uh, coined this term. Accounting is called the language of business. So, you know, if you travel to Mexico, it makes sense to know a little bit of Spanish. So if you go into the field of business, it makes sense to know the basics of accounting. Uh, and accounting serves two large groups of users, external, outside of the company, and internal. So external users include all these groups, right? But for us, the most important one is shareholders. So I'll put this is the most important one. Shareholders or owners, stockholders. We're covering public corporations in this class. And shareholders, uh, in the narrow view, I would call them stockholders, these are 
entities that own shares of stock. And secondarily, lenders, banks, any uh, organizations that lend us money or lend us assets. So it's all about these two groups, primary shareholders. Everything in this class, this is business 1A. We're focusing on external users. We will be creating financial statements that are available to the outside. So if public corporations, they file their financial statements with the government. And I can go to any website of any financial, oh, I'm sorry, of any public corporation and uh, view their financial statements. So that users such as stockholders or lenders can look at the financials and make a decision. Pretty much, should I invest in the company or not? Should I buy shares of stock or should I sell my shares of stock? Internal users are managers and you know officers and internal auditors, employees. So internal users we will be covering in 1B, in managerial accounting. It's a very different animal. It's all about managers, internal users. So external and internal. Financial accounting, this class focuses on external users and managerial accounting is uh, the next class. You need to pass business 1A with a C or higher in order to be able to take business 1B managerial accounting. So guys, I'm not going to talk much about jobs. These are three large areas in which accountants are employed. Public accounting, meaning you work for a CPA and your CPA certified public accounting firm is hired by other businesses and organizations to do audit, to do taxes, to set up their accounting system, and so on and so forth. Uh, private accounting, you work for Nike in their accounting department. You work for Alphabet, which is Google company, in their taxation department. So it's called private or managerial accounting. And then there is a large group where accountants are needed in nonprofit and education in government. Uh, of course, accountants are employed by the IRS. They're employed by FBI. They're employed by every university and school district and nonprofit organizations such as, uh, you know, a lot of hospitals are considered to be nonprofit. Um, sports teams are nonprofit. Theaters, uh, museums, they all employ accountants. And so this is an exhibit uh, of different groups of uh, job opportunities in accounting. And um, I took it from the textbook. Ethics in accounting, absolutely crucial. You know about a lot of examples of cooking the books, companies uh, circumventing the rules, making illegal activities to cook their books. Uh, we will be talking about ethics in every specific chapter when we cover concepts of depreciation or concept of long-term assets or current liabilities uh, or payroll. Uh, so we will spend more time on ethics in every chapter. This is a cool concept of the fraud triangle. So it says that in order for fraud, and fraud is an intentional misappropriation of assets, intentional. It's different from just making a mistake from a human error. So it says that there should, uh, we, we should have three factors must exist for a person to commit fraud. And these are three factors. Opportunity. So there is some ways, there are some, um, Opportunities where uh, an individual can see a low perceived risk of getting caught. And actually, we as managers have a lot of control here. So we use internal controls, we'll talk about them in Chapter 6, to decrease this amount of opportunity to commit fraud. There is also rationalization. So to me, it means that the person feels undervalued, underpaid. And so they're stealing from the company to compensate themselves. And then there is financial pressure on the individual's part. You know, it could be unpaid bills or drug abuse or um, divorce, anything like that, any kind of financial pressure. So let me go to this quick study. It's on page 30, quick study, QS is quick study. So at the end of every chapter, you have QS, quick studies, and then you have exercises, and then you have problems, set A and set B. So every group be becomes kind of bigger. So problems are more comprehensive, longer than exercises or quick studies. Uh, your homework consists of some of the exercises and problems from the end of the book. During the lecture in this video, I will cover a couple of quick studies, sometimes a little bit of the, you know, like one or two exercises. So uh, this is quick study 1-3. Let me get there. 
and it's set up where we just have to identify, you know, for each of the examples right here, is it fraud? Uh, 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 we have to identify a fraud triangle uh, factors. So is it, uh, <clears throat> is it an opportunity, pressure, or rationalization? So the business has no cameras or security devices at its warehouse, so that's an opportunity, right? So an employee can see potential opportunity with low perceived risk, and we as managers can fix it. Managers are expected to grow business or be fired, so they don't have much choice, and so this is an example of a pressure. pressure. Uh, a worker sees other employees regularly take inventory for personal use, and that's an example of rationalization. You know, if everybody else, if everybody else can do it, why can't I do it? Uh, number four, no one matches the cash in the register to receipts when shifts end. That's an opportunity again. Number five, officers are expected to show rising income or risk dismissal. That's pressure. And then the last one, a worker feels that fellow employees are not honest. So that's an example of rationalization. Let me go back to the slides. So that's fraud. And connected to this topic is this law, which was implemented by the Congress in 2002, and it's called Sarbanes-Oxley Act, or SOX. So this is some of the factors that are part of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So make sure you're familiar with them for the quiz. Okay, GAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. So GAP is the framework. It, financial accounting that we are studying is going to be governed by these rules and concepts that are developed by the government body called the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, but because the Securities and Exchange Commission does not have an expertise necessarily in financial accounting, they hire a private body called FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board. So the goal of GAAP, it's not really about the name of the financial statement or the name of the account or, you know, do we put a dollar sign or not next to the amount or do we double underline. It's not about that. It's all about um, providing concept, using concepts uniformly throughout all public corporations so that information provided in financial statements is relevant, relevant, only relevant information that makes sense, that is needed for users to make decisions. It's reliable, you know, so that users trust this information. And it's comparable because I need to compare Apple and Google. I need to compare Southwest Airlines and American Airlines. So it's uh, information should be helpful in contrasting organizations. And so, as I mentioned, even though the Securities and Exchange Commission has a right to oversee GAAP, it actually hires this private group called FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board, and they actually des they design, they set the principles. Uh, they set GAAP. Now, GAAP is only... Um, it's unique to the United States of America. Uh, most of the other countries are using different set of standards called IFRS or International Financial Reporting Standards. And those are developed by uh, an agency located in Switzerland and it's called IASB. We will mostly focus on the US gap, not on IFRS. And so guys, the, again, the objective for gap is Provide financial data to external users, investors and lenders, to make decisions about providing resources to the entity, make to the entity. And um, there are four main principles, four assumptions, and two constraints. I would like you to be familiar with the principles mostly. You don't have to worry much about assumptions and constraints. So these are our four broad principles. We will be using them all the time. Every chapter will be talking about them. Every company that is a public corporation must follow them. And so one is called measurement principle or cost principle, meaning that accounting information is based on actual cost. It's not based on the fair market value, right? So if I bought the building 20 years ago for 
and right now the same building's market value is $1 million, I will be reporting my building at the historical cost because it's something objective. It's something that allows me then to compare one company against the other. And, and if we allow companies to use fair market values, assessments, then it will be quite subjective and impossible to compare companies to each other. Uh, the second one is revenue recognition principle. The main idea here, we are not going to recognize revenue based on cash. That's very different from our personal finances. Businesses recognize revenue when they earn or perform service. Recognize revenue when it's earned. It does not matter whether or not you received cash or not. So sometimes businesses receive cash as advance payments before they perform service, and that's not revenue. Often businesses will receive uh, cash much later, but they recognize revenue when that service is performed on when the goods are delivered. And in the same manner, expenses should be matched against revenues. So this is called the matching principle. A company records expenses incurred to generate revenues without regard to cash. It doesn't matter if we paid cash or not. And then full disclosure, we will have to report the details behind financial statements. We will disclose all different uh, information that might impact decisions of our investors and lenders and these disclosures will be in the notes to financial statements. So let me show you examples. <clears throat> Here we go. On March 1st, Delilah Catering received an advance payment of $10,000 on the wedding, which will take place in June. The company is not allowed to record revenue until June 1st. So on March 1st, the company will record the receipt of cash, but they are not allowed to record revenue, which goes on the income statement, until the actual wedding. So which, which uh, we need to identify an applicable gap principle, and this is, of course, the revenue recognition principle. Number two, Warriors Incorporated purchased its store location in 2000 for $285,000. The building is currently assessed at $870,000, but the company reports its value in the balance sheet, uh, on the balance sheet at $285,000. This is the cost principle or measurement principle, historical cost. Number three, Jerry Corporation uses its accounts receivable as a collateral for a $1 million bank loan. So if the company fails to pay this loan back, then the bank has a right to acquire the company's ARs, accounts receivables. While this information does not need to be reported in the company's books, the company must disclose it in the notes to its financial statements. So this is an example of the disclosure principle. And uh, I'm just going to go up to number four. On January 20th, Francesca Design received a telephone bill for $180. It's not due until February 15th. So for our personal finance, we would not do anything about it, right? Because you and I use so-called cash-based accounting. The companies that follow GAP have to use so-called accrual accounting. In spite of the fact that the cash will not be paid until February 15th, the company must record the telephone expense on the day they receive the bill, on January 20th. So the company will record the telephone expense as well as a liability. So these are your four accounting principles, and again, we will talk more about them in each applicable chapter. These are companies, uh, again, this is GAP, accounting assumptions, all companies follow those. And these are company's constraints. Uh, I also want to mention that every company, public corporation, I should say, files an annual report with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So that's why we, the public, can access financial statements and we, the public, can buy shares of stock in these public corporations. So annual reports are called 10Ks. And also companies file quarterly reports and they're called 10Qs. And guys, there is, you know, I can go right now online here and let me just go Google and I can use any company like Alphabet, which is the Google company. And I will say investor relations. So whenever I want to find an annual report, that's where I'm going to go. Name of the company, investor relations. 
and then usually we can find their C SEC filings, SEC filings. So we can do, uh, you know, search through them and we can just do the filing type, like we can do 10K and search for them. And um, that's what we can do. And we can open an annual report and search through them. Um, let me also do this here. Um, let me just go here to investor relations. And let me show you right here is uh, 10K for Google, for Alphabet, and I can view it as a PDF. And so guys, you can see it's almost 100 pages, right? And so there are all these different items there, like I'm saying on the slides, there, there are notes and auditor's report and so-called management discussion and analysis and a lot of PR fluff, but that's where we find financial statements. So I can always, you know, they're usually in the middle, closer, in the middle, closer to the end, so this is financial statements. And guys, this is the auditor's report. So their auditor is the company Ernst & Young, and these are the financial statements. So every company usually has five financial statements, balance sheet, income statement, statement of comprehensive income. We are not going to cover that one. A statement of stockholders equity. We're also going to just briefly mention it and the statement of cash flows. And so I can view right here is the balance sheet you know, and it's usually the information is given for two years. And this is the income statement. So three years information. So you can see net income. So that's where we find our data. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on the international standards, global standards. I just want to mention here that they're called IFRS or the International Financial Reports and Standards, and they're used by over than 120 countries. Now, the first few chapters, you know, our discussions are very going to be very similar, but then there will be quite a few differences between GAAP and IFRS. Again, in this class, we're going to focus mostly on U the U.S. GAAP. That concludes part one of our uh, lecture for chapter one. Thank you so much.